here, Naja and Jessica. Uh, I said, girl, you're going to have to stay over and preach. Aren't y'all glad I forced her to stay over to preach? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, certainly, uh, we love Donna and Dedrick and Kyle and Coltrane. And uh, uh, love to always get a chance to experience the blessing of their family, friendship, and fellowship. And so she doesn't need much introduction. I know some of you weren't here, uh, perhaps when she was here for those several years serving as our executive pastor and uh, was and is, continues to be a very important extension of our ministry and just always so blessed by her. Currently she serves as the chaplain and director of spiritual formation at Meredith College. Is that pretty good? Yeah, Meredith College. Oh look, that's her, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so glad to have her here. So come on y'all, let's welcome Donna back to the way. Stand to your feet, put your hands together for Pastor Donna Battle as she comes to minister the word. faces and to be in this space. I'm thankful to God who, you know, it's one of those things where you reach moments in your life and and you realize that the language you have isn't really sufficient for what you've experienced and particularly what you've experienced with God and how God has revealed God's self. And so, you know, you try to figure out ways and you use a whole lot of words and they still don't seem sufficient. And then you try to use fewer words and they still don't seem sufficient. And you try to tell stories and it still doesn't seem to be sufficient and so finally you just end up saying well God is good <laughs> amen and so we simply say God is good because we know that our language doesn't really speak to it but that's the best that we can do to really say it and so I'm thankful and I'm humble to be in this space I'm humble for the way that God has loved me I'm thankful for the way that God has blessed me through the person of G, um, Dedrick Battle and through the person of Kyle Battle and through the person of Coltrane Battle. And I'm thankful for God has blessed me through my friendships here, right? Through my love for Mike and Sharice, amen. And through my love for all of my closest friends who are in this space, I am thankful. Well, we're gonna dig in, amen. So that's all the preliminaries we're gonna do. I miss y'all, I love y'all, I'm here, amen. Um, so we're going to talk this morning about what am I missing? Do you all have the slides for us? If not, I'll pull up the, they got it. All right, because I'm going to read from that simply because I have a different version on my phone of the scripture. But if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to them, does anybody actually have a Bible here? Hey, I should have bought a how to look at that. They got Bibles. How about that? Well, I got it on my phone. Amen. And it's going to be on your screen in just a minute. Um, so Luke 24. Um, and we'll start reading at um, verse 13. Great. This is a familiar passage to some of you, um, maybe not so much to others, but we're going to read it anyhow. It says, now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you, are, while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there on these days. He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses all and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near the village which they were going, he walked ahead of, as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? What am I missing? What am I missing? Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we enter into a space of worship with anticipation, many of us with expectation. But God, we often come into spaces where where we can receive exactly what we need, but our minds are so scattered, our minds wander. And so God, we're just asking that in our human frailty that you will pull those thoughts in, that you allow us to center ourselves enough to be fully present right here, right now, not necessarily only with each other, but also with you. God, that we may hear you in our own personal way, and then in our way collectively as your body. God, that we may be transformed, that we might be changed, that we may be encouraged to go on a little bit further. God, that we may receive life and love in this space. Breathe on us, oh God, that we might live. In your matchless name we pray. Amen. So for those of you who don't know my daughter, her name is Kayo. Kayo, if you listen, I love you, baby. It's a good story. Um, Kaya was about one and a half when my father died. And so we were pretty sure, meaning my husband and I, Dedrick and I were pretty sure or fairly sure that she didn't have a real concept or grasp of what it means to die, right, of death. And so we started to take note, though, that as she got older, two, three, four, she continued to pray for her Baba Don. And so, you know, we thought it was beautiful, but when it kept happening, you know, I remember saying to her one night, I said, baby, you do know that Baba Don died. She says, yeah, mama, I know. I said, okay, well, I think it's good that you pray for him. I said, but can you tell mama, what are you thinking when you pray for Baba Don? And she says, I'm thinking he's going to live again like Jesus, like y'all said. She said, and mama, I just keep waiting for him to come back. Do you know when he's coming back? <laughs> this is one of those parent moments, right? You're like, uh. I was like, well, I don't know, baby. I said, well, baby, you know, I'm pretty sure Baba Don isn't going to come back in the way we remember him. It's all kind of a mystery, but I think it's good that we keep praying for him. And I said, you know, I do believe Baba Don still exists or lives in some kind of way. I just don't know how and I'm pretty sure it's not in a way it's still in a way that keeps us missing him and wishing we could hug him and you know I finally look at her face and she has this incredibly confused look on her face as she should right and I'm like it's okay baby we just gonna keep praying for Baba Don she's like okay (laughs) (laughs) Jesus died like Jesus died They watched him die a heinous death. And Jesus was dead, not Machiavelli dead, not Juliet and Romeo and Juliet dead. He was dead. They watched him, his body be placed in the tomb. Now, y'all, anybody who watched 
or who had seen the kind of death that Jesus died would be traumatized by that, right? We hear our veterans, we heard Deke talk about the trauma, right? And understanding what it means to have life because he, he, his life was a threat, was threatened, right? This was traumatizing. And imagine if you are watching someone you love, that you've walked with, that you care for, die in this way. This was a trauma thing. Now, that's a sermon for another day, but I just wanted to name what we often don't. That the people who loved Jesus, who watched him die, were traumatized by that. And so these were two followers of Jesus, the Monday after his death, walking on the road to Emmaus, and they're doing what grief-stricken, pain-filled people do after they've been traumatized. They talk about it and they rehearse it, trying to make sense of it, hoping that what is real isn't. And they're sad and they're consumed. And our account says that Jesus comes near, but that their eyes are kept from recognizing him. And so Jesus does what Jesus does. Jesus engages them. He's like, hey, what y'all talking about and why y'all looking so sad? One of the men, Cleopas, is like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, you have got to be the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the events that have happened. And he begins to recount from the beginning all the things that have happened, including the fact that the women had gone to the tomb and found it empty. He says, but you know, we had really hoped that he, that Jesus, was going to be the one to redeem Israel. And then this stranger named Jesus, says to them, how foolish you are. He begins to start with Moses and goes through all of the scriptures, and he begins to reveal all of the things that are there about himself. They are walking, and they are talking, and they begin to reach their destination. Jesus walks ahead a bit, and they beg him to stay. No, 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 stay with us. It's late. It's almost dark. Come, stay with us. They go in. They sit down, and Jesus does what Jesus does. Jesus blesses the bread, and he breaks it, and he serves them. Their eyes are open because that is familiar to them. And as soon as they recognize Jesus, he vanishes. And they say, did not our hearts burn? While he was talking to us on the road and opening up the scriptures to us, and they can barely contain themselves as they go and tell the other 11, Jesus, yep, it really happened, y'all. He's risen. So I must admit that I'm tired. Yes. My sister, no. My mind is tired. My body is tired. And many days my spirit is tired. As I process my own painful experiences and the experiences of those in my immediate family who are closest to me and the pain and struggle of those that I have a particular call to be present in their pain with. And as I process the pain of the people um, in our community and in our nation and in the world, and then as I process the, the, the experience and the mindset of those who um, have heart and hearts who perpetuate this pain, right? or who contribute to this pain, or as I even consider those who are well-meaning, but who in their ignorance, because their experience is so different, don't realize that their lack of humility causes almost more pain in the face of those who are pressed down by society than those who have a hardened heart and couldn't give a flip. And I admit that there are days, seasons, one that I've had very recently where I'm just tired. And in those moments, it becomes really hard for me to, like, swallow Christianese Bible talk. It might be true. It's true. But I can't swallow it in that moment. You know? Don't be weary and well-doing. Well, too late. Right? (laughs) I'm past the weary line about a mile. You know? But if we're honest with ourselves, most of us, if not all of us, have a place of grace in our life that always brings us back to the fight. Something that just won't let us quit. Now, for me, in my season, not always, but in my season right now, it's my kids. Right? It's my kids. It's like Michelle said earlier, you know, 
I was fighting for my kids, right? I joined to make this better for my kids. They have been that point of grace for me. So if this thing called redemption, if this thing called justice, if this thing called healing and restoration won't let me go, then I have got to find a different way to hold it. I got to find a different way to carry it. I got to find a different way to deal with it. I'm telling you, I started to ask myself, what am I missing? In these dark seasons, what am I missing? So I have a confession to make. This sermon today is about me and my journey. Okay? It's about the questions I had to ask God. It's about a particular season in my life that created tremendous struggle for me that I'm just now coming out of. Now, if you are a person and you're sitting here and you're saying, well, you know, I think it's kind of self-serving for you to preach a sermon about yourself. I'm okay with that. I can take that. (laughs) And I will say, if you are offended, I am sorry. But that all we can ever do is give what we got. And this is all I got today. All right? This is what I got to give. Now, I must give another spoiler alert. There will be no aha, blow your mind kind of points in this sermon. Everything I share from this part of my particular journey and season that I'm coming out of is old. I mean, it's the stuff many of us have been hearing since our grandparents, right? It's old stuff, but because of where I was in my life, it was presented to me in a new way. All right? So what am I missing? I believe this passage is a passage that God used in my process of moving me to where I am. I just want to share a few of those points with you, if that's all right. Okay? The first thing about this passage that I found very intriguing that was a part of this process for me was that Jesus was a stranger to them. Was that Jesus was a stranger to them. So I grew up pretty much being taught and hearing people preach that, you know, in this particular passage where you hear that their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus, that somehow there was this supernatural power that hindered them from seeing Jesus. Well, as I reread this passage, I realized that that may have been wrong. Like maybe we had made the wrong assumption about some, you know, godly supernatural power keeping them from recognizing Jesus. And so when I reread it, it didn't say that Jesus kept them from recognizing Jesus. It simply said that their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. Now, some of you may remember um, a research project I shared with you all several years ago, um, done by two psychologists. It was an observation, um, well, it was a research project on observation in the human brain. It was called the invisible gorilla. Some of you may be familiar with the invisible gorilla. So here's the concept. The concept is they would gather people together and they would show them a video. And in the video, there would be six people, three people in white T-shirts, three people in black T-shirts. And they would be passing a basketball around and moving spaces while they pass it. And everybody who observed this video were told, you need to count how many times the people in the white T-shirts, yes, the white T-shirts, pass the ball back and forth, right? And then after it was over, they would tell them how many times was, you know, the basketball was passed. And then they would ask them, did you see the man in the gorilla suit? 50% of the people said no. So they would rewind the video and the people would be shocked to see that midway through the video, a man in a gorilla suit comes to the middle of the stage, bangs his chest and then exits. (laughs) And that they never saw it the first time around. Well, another psychologist by um, the name of Dr. Wiseman says that people miss the man in the gorilla suit for the same reason they miss opportunities in their life. That the human brain is trained to see what it wants to see. Right? That oftentimes we are so focused on finding what we want to find that we miss obvious but unexpected things. Right? Could it be? Could it be that these two followers on the road to Emmaus missed seeing Jesus or couldn't recognize Jesus because they had no expectation of seeing Jesus? They had no expectation that Jesus was really alive. They weren't expecting it. 
that in their pain and in their trauma and in their grief, they couldn't see it. Now, I must admit that when I'm at my lowest point, when I am really consumed by pain, God feels strange to me. God feels distant to me. But what I realized in reading this passage is not that Jesus isn't close. Jesus is there. It's that I can't see Jesus or feel Jesus because in my pain, my brain cannot conceptualize the resurrection of such a dismal experience and situation. I can't see it. And when we start thinking about expectation and imagination, that starts to lead us down a road to hope, which takes us to the next thing in this passage that I found so intriguing in this journey of mine. These men says, we had, as in past tense, we had hoped. We don't, we don't hope now. We hope before he died on the cross and was laid in the tomb, right? We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And so I began to ask another question. So what would redemption look like for them? And then I had to turn it inward. I said, well, what does redemption look like for me? Like, how do I envision redemption? And if, by reasoning, I know that when I am full of pain and full of struggle, if I can miss seeing Jesus when Jesus is right before my face, could it be that I have misconceptualized or don't fully understand what redemption looks like when I might see it? Jesus was right there. They were talking to Jesus, and they were saying we had hoped that he would. A mentor of mine calls this faulty reasoning, and he explains it like this. He says, if you think about the children of Israel um, getting ready to cross the Red Sea, he said they had no concept, no imagination that would allow them to see a way out of that situation. They could not imagine how they could cross the Red Sea. And so because they could not see it, they were willing to go back to Pharaoh. They were willing to turn back to death, back to oppression, right? Just because they could not see the way out. When God was poised to do something far above their level of consciousness, right? God was poised to defy their imagination or their ability to see the way out. And I said, oh my goodness, that'll preach. So I'm preaching it. <laughs> was doing something more and I realized as I went back to the passage that Jesus never asked them to understand or to see how what would happen would happen right I mean even if we look at the teachings of Jesus where he you know proclaims about his death before he died right he often spoke in riddles parables so they really couldn't understand a lot of what they said he said which is why this is the first moment he's really revealing this stuff right he opens up the scripture he shows the way in this moment he had never asked them to see the way out he just asked them to believe it and I realized that I had hope all wrong hope isn't seeing the way out it's believing there is a way out right that's hope it's believing there is a way out. If we got to see the way out, we will always be perpetually hopeless. And hopeless disciples are useless. Why? Because we can justify doing nothing. Right? We can, hey, ain't no need for me to fight you. They gonna win anyway. Right? This is about hopelessness. So I began to sit with this a little more. Because it wouldn't leave me alone. I said, okay, something else is here. Something else is here. What am I missing? And then I saw it. If hopeless disciples are useless because they do nothing, then could that be why scripture says faith without works is dead? And it dawned on me. It dawned on me that here were these two followers of Christ on this road to Emmaus, grieving the death of Jesus when what was really dying was inside of them, their faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance 
of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. They had been told in scripture that this would happen. They had been told by Jesus, albeit in a way they couldn't understand before his death, that this would happen. They had seen Jesus die and they heard the testimony of the women and that these women had also talked to an angel and they still didn't believe. Why? Because nobody actually saw Jesus. Now, who does scripture say Jesus is? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. So because they did not see Jesus, because they could not see the way, they lost their hope and therefore their faith. This shook me, y'all. It shook me. And the reason it shook me so much was because if faith is the substance of things hoped for and is the evidence of things unseen, then what we see here is that they had plenty of evidence and the evidence wasn't faulty. What was faulty was their essence. The essence of their belief, of their faith. What is the essence of our belief? Jesus is. They knew Jesus was human. They saw that human Jesus die. But did they really believe Jesus was divine? Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Could it be that they knew Jesus was human, but they had not fully conceptualized the fact that Jesus was also God? Because you see, this kind of trouble, coming back from the death, this kind of pain requires more than human power. It requires a divine savior, not just a human savior, right? So what if this whole process, this whole experience was about them understanding the divine nature of Christ? And so I'm still in a really jacked up place at this point in my study of this passage, because I'm like, okay, God, I see that and I get that, but I get why they were in despair. Like I get why they had lost their faith. Like I get why they were wavering. Like that kind of pain, that kind of trauma like shapes you. You know, you, you kind of give up all your stuff and you follow somebody and, and all this kind of stuff happens. And I mean, this thing is complicated, Lord, right? I mean, like think about my conversation with my daughter about resurrection. Like that is far above my intellectual pay grade to actually <laughs> figure out what resurrection means. Like none of us really get it right? We, we act like we do. We don't get it, right? And then Jesus calls them foolish, right? Really, Jesus, like, was that necessary? Like, where's the grace? You know, again, this is about me, right? So I'm talking about them, but I'm feeling like me. Like, I'm feeling like God just called me a fool. And I'm feeling some kind of way about it. And so I go back to the passage. And what do I see? I realized that even though these men were in despair, even though these men were full of pain, even though these men were on this road to Emmaus and they were not in any way seeking to find Jesus, Jesus had come to find them. That Jesus came to where they were, even though there was no concept in their mind that they needed to go and seek Jesus. Jesus was right where they were. I said, oh, my goodness. All right, Jesus, you where I am. You're going to come for me, right? You're going to come for me. And so all of this kind of culminated in a moment for me. When I was on my way to work one Monday morning, my kids in the back seat, and we jam into Lecrae's new album. If y'all ain't heard Lecrae's new album, it is fire. Fire! It is off the chain, okay? So... I'm listening to, I think the song is like 828, right? And I'm jamming to it. It's going to all work. I'm not going to sing because that would not be pretty. It's going to all work out sooner or later, right? Don't you worry about tomorrow. It's going to work out in your favor, right? And I'm just jamming. And then I realized that I've been acting like I didn't believe it was going to work out. Like, and I started crying. Like, my parent, my, you know, my Kyle has a really tender heart. And she's like, mommy, you all right? I'm like, I'm fine, baby. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. <laughs> like all these pieces began to 
to come together and fit together in ways that I hadn't seen it. And I said, oh my goodness, God, I had started to believe that it wasn't going to work out. And I'm not talking about my presence with other people. Like I was still praying for people. I was still believing on behalf of other people. I was still giving other people hope. I'm talking about my own internal experience with being in my pain and with the pain of other people. I'm talking about how I was experiencing this. I said, I had started to believe that I may have been lying to people. And it was like God reached out and literally touched my despair. It was like I had been struggling to breathe and I didn't know it. And God handed me an oxygen mask. I was on New Bern Avenue, not looking for God, but God had met me there and found me. And I said, oh, my goodness. And then it just started playing out in my head, right? You know, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, that was God. It probably was God, right? All I know is that it happened, and I attribute it to God. Because some things I think about, I, I want to say it's God, but it might not be. <laughs> but because it led me to life, I'm going to say it was Jesus. <laughs> so all these connections start being made in my head, right? And it's like, it's, it's as if God is saying, so Donna, if you don't believe it's going to work out, then isn't that an unconscious denial of my resurrection? And if you are unconsciously denying my resurrection, are you also unconsciously denying my divinity? And I realized that I had let God go. Somewhere along the line, I love God, I love Jesus with all my heart, but somewhere unconsciously, I had stopped believing that God is God, that Jesus was real. I was acting like God was dead. And I realized in that moment that just like we can't know the necessity of water unless we've been thirsty. And just like we can't know the value of food unless we've been hungry. I'm not sure our faith is real if it's never been questioned or doubted at any point in our life. Even if at some point I have actually lost it, how can your faith ever be real if it's never been questioned? In that moment, I knew faith in a different way. It was my darkest moment. And I said, okay, God, I said, well, why didn't you just come up to those two men on the road to Emmaus and say, hey, it's me, I'm back. Right? Like, why was this a necessary part? And this is why. Like, could it be not that these men were in pain in order to learn this lesson, but because in this jacked up, broken world, we're going to have pain and it's inevitable that Jesus uses it as a conduit to redemption anyway. Could it be that Jesus says, I'm going to use your grief and your trauma around what you can't see and what you don't know to reveal my divine nature to you? You see, faith is made real in our darkest moments, not because we get it right, not because we have so much faith in the face of this pain and trauma, but pain and faith is made real in our darkest moments because no matter what, the process of redemption that Jesus started so long ago will not be deterred because of my conscious or unconscious disbelief at any moment. My faith is made real because nothing I or anyone else does in this jacked up, broken world can change the good, loving, gracious nature of our God. My faith is made real in my darkest moment because Jesus stands there with me and hands back to me the reality that he is not just human, but that he is God and that he ain't dead. And that that reality is the knowledge I need to have peace as I walk this weary, weary trail. That I don't have to see the way out. I ain't got to figure the way out. I just need to know I'm already in the process This thing is already being redeemed. And so God says, now take my peace because you already know the end is finished. You don't have to figure that out and walk with me to help that redemption come forth. 
So no, I don't know how this nation and this world is going to be repaired. I don't know how the abuse and the injustice that we experience is going to be healed ultimately. I don't know how Baba Don lives or will live again. I don't know. All I know is that all of those things are going to be possible because Jesus is also God and that God is not dead. And how do I know that? I know that because when I let Jesus go, when I stop seeking God, God seems to find a way to find me, to be present with me. And if I can stay with that strange Jesus long enough, then Jesus will remind me of the familiarity. If I can just lean in long enough to that strange Jesus, then I will be reminded that God never left me. And so when I ask myself, what am I missing? Maybe all this time, in my darkest moments, all I've been missing is God. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet, everyone? Grab the hand of someone next to you. here today and you just need to invite God to walk alongside you and open up your eyes so you can think about what are you missing the great thing about God is that God is always meeting us at the point of our need whatever your road to Emmaus may be Whatever circumstance you may be dealing with today, just ask the Lord to meet you there. Meet you at the lowest point of your need. Because God is not absent. God is not unable to find you right where you are. Scripture says that the hands of God are not too short that they won't save you. So ask God, Lord, find me right where I am and open up my eyes, my heart, so I can see what I am missing. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I touch these hands. My neighbor, my friend, my brother, my sister, my loved one. I touch these hands because I know that I need you to bless them right where they stand. I may not know exactly what they need, but 
I know that all of us are in a place of need. And I pray that as I'm touching them, that you would give them strength and power, revelation, open their eyes, encourage their heart, cause them to see and to know that victory and help is within their grasp. I pray, God, for their family. I pray for their well-being. I pray for their own internal struggles. I pray, God, that you will send peace that passes all understanding. I pray that the tears that are welling up in their eyes and flowing, I pray, God, that you will be the one that makes these tears redemptive. I pray, God, for... the torture and the pain that is in their mind and the trouble that seems to be coming against them on every side. I pray, God, that you will bless them. Now, everybody, lift your hands right where you stand. It is me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister. It is not my brother. But it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you I need you to find me, God. I need you to meet me. I need you to restore my hope and my faith and my joy and my strength. Do it in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you will save me. Save me from all my sins and my errors and my disobedience and empower me with the spirit that causes me to live victoriously fulfilling my purpose your call on my life and we'll say thank you lord we'll say thank you lord thank you for meeting us thank you for meeting me thank you for meeting my family and so god in the name of jesus show us what we're missing Show us what we are missing. In Jesus' name we pray. We have a few minutes to open up the altar. You may be here today and you want to accept Jesus as your Savior. Come and meet us at the altar. You may be here and you have some prayer situations that you need someone to touch and agree with you around. Come and meet us here at the altar. You may be here and you just need someone to touch and agree with you because you are missing something. And you know that God can feel that void, feel that emptiness, feel that concern. Take a few moments and come and let's pray together. Let's ask God to meet you, meet us. Because I believe God is able to do everything that we ask in the name of the Lord. Come from all over the building and let's pray together. Let's seek the face of God together. Let's seek the hope of God together. Meet me here at the cross. At the cross.